been a few weeks uh, since I've been here, so it's, uh, it's good to see you. I've missed uh, each of your smiling, joyful faces. Last week I was in Gerald. Uh, they had a congregational meeting, and uh, man, it was really good. They have, uh, we, we added six new members uh, to the church, and then two people are going to be baptized, I think today, actually. So, yeah, some very good, good things are going on over there. And the week before that, Nikki and I were celebrating uh, 26 years of marriage, and we were in Hawaii. So it's, uh, it's good to be here. Also, someone in Gerald mentioned last week that... Um, as a church, they noticed that we are 21 years old last weekend. So just think about that for a second. That's something to celebrate. Last year was 20 years as a church, but it was COVID, so I guess there's nothing to celebrate. But we do want to <laughs> mention these things just so we can have things to be thanking the Lord for. And uh, Friday was Bonnie's birthday, so I hope that y'all get a chance to wish her back. Yes, I don't think she's in here, but uh, we uh, really love Bonnie and appreciate her. She's been with us since the start of the church and has been on staff, oh gosh, a long, long time. At least 15 years uh, that she's been on staff. So she's a faithful, faithful servant of the Lord, so we love her and appreciate her. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. I, I want to I have some time to, to pray this morning uh, for some of the things that are going on in Afghanistan. Uh, as you may know, uh, there are uh, Christians there that will and have been facing persecution, so I want to, to pray for those. Uh, just something as simple as having the Bible on your phone could lead to execution over in Afghanistan. So I want to pray uh, for those, also, uh, we lost some service members, and uh, you know, this is really, I didn't realize how, how close this hits to home, but as you may know or not know, Caleb is on an aircraft carrier over there right now, and he had members from his ship, both Marines and Navy, go into Afghanistan, and so of those 13 uh, that uh, died, one of them that was gravely injured, and one of them that died uh, was in Caleb's unit. So these are boys that he knows. So my heart is just so heavy just to think about that. I was looking at the list of these boys, and they're all Caleb's age except for one. And we were talking to Caleb Blass, and he was really excited about coming home for, for Christmas. And so I think about those families and the fact that their son won't be home for Christmas. So if we could just pray uh, this morning... For, for those families that um, have a son that, that's lost. And uh, pray for these uh, believers in Afghanistan that are facing persecution. Uh, let us pray. Father, thank you for this time where we could come and, and sing to you and just acknowledge that, that you are faithful and uh, that your love for us is, is so great. We thank you so, mi so much for the freedoms that we have in this country to worship you, to say the name of Jesus, to open up the Bible. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan that that, that freedom is, is, um, is not there for them and that their lives are in danger, that they're on the run, they're persecuted, uh, they can and will die. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them, and I pray that um, you would protect them. I pray that, um, oh, it's just hard to know exactly what to say, but Lord, we just lift up these brothers and sisters in Christ to you. Lord, you say in your word that, uh, that we will face persecution for knowing you and for believing in you and following you. And so if that's the journey that they're to be on, Lord, I pray that they would experience your presence and strength um, in a measure that uh, just can't be measured. Lord, we also lift up the families of those who have lost a son. Lord, comfort them. Bring others around them to encourage them, to love on them during this time. Can't imagine the feelings of loss and pain, questions, sorrow that they have, but may they be comforted by you, by those around them. And so we continue to pray for 
American citizens that are there in Afghanistan, and we continue to pray for um, servicemen and women, Marines, Navy, Army, Air Force, those that are there in this transitional time. Lord, protect them. We pray for our leaders and government. We give them wisdom at this time. Uh, thank you so much for what you're going to do in our lives and our hearts today. Lord, we just give you this service, and we pray that you would speak to us through your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to put the Bible bookshelf up there and just remind us that we're going through all these books of the Bible in five years. And so we find ourselves in this, uh, this poetry section over here. <laughs> Kevin, I'm, I'm pointing in the right area, right? Yes. Yeah. The, 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 those purple books is where, where, where we are right now. <laughs> Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. These are the poetry books, the wisdom books. Uh, Solomon uh, had a hand in four of those. He, he has two uh, Psalms, and then David uh, wrote uh, over 70 of them. And then uh, Solomon wrote Proverbs, and then he wrote uh, Song of Solomon, which we'll be looking at next year. And then he wrote Ecclesiastes, which we're looking at today. And so that's what we've been doing. We'll be finishing up next week. And then uh, the following week, we'll actually be down here in uh, Colossians. So that's where we'll uh, be going next. And then we'll be over there in the general epistles. We'll be 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude um, this fall. So that's, a, that's our journey that we're on, and so today we're looking at uh, Ecclesiastes 5 and 6. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn to Ecclesiastes 5 and 6. Also, the outline is in your program. We'll be putting the verses up on the screen. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, who was King David's son. He was called the wisest man that, that had ever lived. God appeared to him in a dream and says, I'll give you uh, anything that you ask for. And so Solomon asked for wisdom. So he's considered the wisest man that ever lived on the planet until uh, the Lord Jesus Christ stepped foot on the planet. So Solomon, uh, not only was he the wisest, but he was the wealthiest man. We read in Kings that he had an annual income of 25 tons of gold. That's, uh, that's, that's wealthy. So if he had invited over uh, Bill Gates and Sam Walton uh, for dinner, he'd actually feel sorry for them because they don't have uh, nearly what, what he has. So he was, he was wealthy. And so he decided to do this experiment. He said, I, I want to really understand what life is all about. What, what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? And so he tried to put himself into all of these areas that we've been looking at, education. He says, I, I sought out to learn everything that I could learn, and I found that it was meaningless. Work, pleasure, it's all meaningless. And that word meaningless, the word heved in the Hebrew, it means uh, nothingness. It means a vapor. It's just like a, a soap bubble that's just there for a moment, and then it pops, and you're left with nothing in your hand. So he says today, uh, possessions, he discovered that they were also meaningless, and so this word meaningless is used again and again and again and again in the book of Ecclesiastes. Over 35 times Solomon uh, recognizes these plights, these observations in life, and then he labels them as being meaningless. And so he talks about life under the sun, meaning life on the earth apart from God. So if we're seeking any of these things apart from God, uh, they will not bring us happiness or give us lasting meaning. So w the little outline here that you have at the top of your outline, it says that God teaches me through the life of Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes that possessions will not ultimately satisfy my mind, heart, or soul. Living for possessions will not only leave me empty, but also create a huge load to bear. I think one of the mantras in our society today is Get all you can, as fast as you can, as much as you can, and then sit on the can. The self-storage industry in the United States is a 22.6 billion annual industry a year. To get a grip on this number, the self-storage industry makes more than the motion picture industry in our country. Yeah, they, they make a lot of money, and they, uh, there are more self-storage units uh, it outnumbers McDonald's, Starbucks, and KFC's combined. 
So if you just think about our, you know, area of Leander, how many self-storage units are there compared to the McDonald's and the Starbucks and all that? There, they, there's a lot more of them. So the self, selfstorage.org says that there are more than 2.2 billion square feet of storage in the United States. Now, how much is 2.2 billion square feet? Well, to put this in perspective, you'd have to take all the stuff out of these self-storage units. You could fill all the homes in Leander, and that would not be enough space. You'd have to fill all the homes in Liberty Hill as well, and that would still not be enough space. You'd have to go ahead and add the homes of Cedar Park, and that's still not enough space. You'd have to add all the homes in Round Rock and Georgetown, and that's still not enough to stack all the stuff all the way to the, to the ceiling of all these homes. You'd have to stack the stuff in the Walmarts, the HEBs, the outlet malls, Lakeline Mall. It would still not be enough. You'd have to stack stuff in every yard every driveway, every road, you'd have to cover all the square feet of these communities combined to equal 2.2 billion square feet. Why do we have, as Americans, this obsession to collect stuff, to amass stuff, to amass possessions? And um, I think the, the simple answer is it just seems to be human nature. It seems to be human nature. If, if, we, if we can, uh, we do, and we will. So Solomon is going to speak to something today that I think we can all identify with. We can all realize that, yes, this is true. This is the word of God, and uh, I have a problem. And so today I stand before you uh, guilty. <laughs> guilty of, of everything that the Bible is, is saying uh, Solomon testifies is true. I can testify it's true, and I'm sure you can too. You can also say, yeah, you know, I, I've got a lot of stuff. How many of you have a lot of stuff? You just be honest and say, i got a lot of stuff. And um, I don't know why. I don't know why we, Nikki and I, when we first got married, we lived in a little 1940s farmhouse. And I kid you not, the closet was about this big. And we had to do double-decker, you know, to fit our stuff. And we didn't have a dishwasher. And then we moved uh, to Fort Worth. And we also lived in a 1940s, uh, probably, you know, World War II t type of house. And uh, you had to have your pants down before you could get into the bathroom. That's how small the, the bathroom was. So <laughs> it was small closets, small bathrooms, small bedroom. We didn't have a, a dishwasher there either. And then when we were in Eagle Pass, we lived in the Parsonage. And the Parsonage was probably like a 1950 uh, asbestos lead paint house. But it, for the first time in, in 1997, we had uh, central air. And we had, we didn't have a dishwasher though. And it wasn't until we moved to Leander in the year 2000 that we had our first dishwasher. And so what we've done is I've noticed that each time that Nikki and I move, we, we keep moving up to a bigger house with a little bit more uh, space and a little bit more uh, stuff. And every time, I've noticed every time we add a, a child, we, we build another house, don't we? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, we had the house in Leander, and then we lived over there off in Georgetown. You know, when, after Noel was born and after Danielle was born, we, we built here in Liberty Hill. And we just... Our houses just keep getting bigger. And, and let me ask you this. Now that we have a, a pretty large closet, do you think we have less stuff or more stuff? We have more stuff. That's right. And, and it's just amazing. As, as I bring in, we were in Hawaii uh, for, for our anniversary. We found some things on sale at Walmart. That's the thing. That, right? So it's on sale. These shirts are on sale. So I've got, you know, like a little stack of these shirts that I have from Walmart. And I realized, wait a minute, if I'm going to bring stuff in, I need to be start taking stuff out. Have you, have you dealt with that? That thing's like... Okay, you cannot keep bringing stuff in without taking stuff out. So I've been in this process for the last several weeks of trying to downsize the closet, the office, and the garages next. Nikki's going to be very happy that we're going to start attacking the garage. So I'm just saying I don't know what it is about human nature, but we just tend to, to collect stuff. And, and even, even though we mean well, like in our family, my mom years ago uh, we decided at Christmas time. What we're going to do is we're going to take the Samaritan's purse and, and we're going to pick out something in the Samaritan's purse and that'll be our Christmas gift that we're going to spend. We're going to buy a goat or, you know, a, an orchard or a well or whatever. And so we're, we're doing that. But even though we've decided to do that as a family to, to, to do less at Christmas, we still leave the house with all this stuff. 
uh, presents. How many of you have Christmas presents that end up in the garage sale or, or, or they end up you know, at Goodwill? Or I've got presents that, that I, I took the wrapper off, but they're still sitting there in the box. So we, we have such blessings around us that uh, it, it's, we're, we're loaded down by possessions. And so here's number one, the first, the first point that the Solomon points out. He's going to point out some very truthful statements. Number one, possessions, the more I have, the more I want. Yeah, you don't even have to know what the, the, the blank's going to be. You just know it by, by heart. Well, the more we have, the more we want. Those who love money will never have enough. So what we need to establish, first of all, from the Bible, is that money itself is, is not wrong. It's the love of money. That's what it says in, in, uh, in Timothy. He says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. Dave Ramsey said it well. He said, money is like a, you know, amoral object. It's like a brick. Think about a brick. With a brick, you can do good with a brick. You could build a house. You could build a hospital. It's, it all depends on your heart. Or with a brick, you could break out a window or, or hurt someone with the brick. So it's not the brick. It's our heart towards the brick. It's our heart towards the money. So the Bible says over and over and over that we're not to love money. And so if you love money, you will never have enough. I think it was Rockefeller who was one of the first billionaires. And he was asked, hey, how much you know, money is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And that's something that we all uh, struggle with. We all deal with the fact that we just need a little bit more. Number two, possessions will not make me happy long term. Ecclesiastes 5.10, how meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. How many of you know that as Americans, <clears throat> we, are, we are wealthy when it considered, uh, compared to world standards? I was doing research on this just this week, just to, again, verify this fact, but 41% of the world's population lives on less than $10 a day. 41% of the world's population lives on less than $10 a day. So just think about that for a second. Uh, you know, if you drive over here and, uh, and, and go by the Dairy Queen, they, they, they're willing to pay a teenager or whoever wants to work there, what is it, $12 or $15 an hour? 12 So just a teenager working one hour makes more than 41% of people on this entire planet. Uh, when we drive into Austin and we stop there, you know, at an intersection and we see the people with the little can and the little cardboard, our hearts go out to them, don't they? Don't, don't, don't they? I mean, we, we feel sorry for this person. But again, I was doing research. You know how much a person that's sitting there on the, the sidewalk makes an average? 70 to $300 a day is what the average panhandler makes. So think about that for a second. The people that we consider poor, 300 bucks a day, times five days a week if they decide to work that, $1,500 a week, think, you know, think about that you know, over a month, that's it's doing pretty well in that. So the truth is, our definition of wealthy is someone who has more than us. But what we need to understand is that we are wealthy. This morning, I just, I just, because it all, it changes the the average household income for residents in Leander is one hundred and one thousand dollars. Leander, that's the average household income of Leander. So that what that does is that makes us Leanderites, Leanderthals. It makes us in the top two to four percent of the wealthiest people on this entire planet. But how many of us don't feel wealthy? I don't know, we don't feel wealthy, no. Wealth is, is uh, Bezos or Gates or 
Trump or somebody else. It's not us. But I want us to understand that we are, by the world's standards, wealthy. And let me ask you this. As Americans, are we happy? I think I talked about this in, in week one. One third. They're saying one third of all Americans today are clinically depressed. 51% of young people say they are depressed and hopeless. That's why youth ministry is so important today. Children's ministry is so important today because our kids are surrounded by so much wealth, possessions, and stuff, and yet inside they feel hopeless, depressed, Sad, we have problems with drugs, anxiety. For being such a small portion of the world's population, we're using 70% of the opiates. We have it, but it's not equating into happiness, is it? And so I think we, we have to recognize this deeply and, and realize that it's not more stuff that's going to make me happy. So the word of God is true. It's meaningless. It's empty to think that wealth brings true happiness. So the more we have, the more we want. And when we have it, it's not giving us happiness long term. Number three, possessions are costly and temporary. Ecclesiastes 5.11, the more you have, the more people will come and help you spend it. How many of you noticed that before? <laughs> They've got their hand out. When you study lottery winners, I'm fascinated by this. You think that someone that hit the lottery, you know, they're, they're just going to be the happiest person of all. But uh, they, they report being the most unhappy people. Why? Because you have all these people that are coming out of the woodwork to help you to spend that money. You've got car artists, salesmen, relatives you haven't heard from. <laughs> ask rock stars, ask pro football players, these pro athletes, a large group of them uh, end up bankrupt because they don't know how to handle it. They don't know how to manage it. And um, people will help you spend it. The government will take it Con artists, lawyers, there, there's unlimited ways to lose what you have. So what good is, is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? You ever notice that? You get something and then next thing you know, it's, it's gone. It's so easy for us to spend money. It's so easy for us to lose money. They are temporary. Number four, also the word of God teaches us that possessions are a heavy load. Now, this is interesting to me because the, the Hebrew word here, there's another serious tragedy. He's now, uh, we're now in chapter six, verse one, that I've seen under the sun and it weighs heavily on humanity. Now this Hebrew word, when it says weighs heavily, it's easy to maybe dismiss that and re not realize what he's talking about. But weighs heavily, this means like, have you all heard of the, the straw that broke the camel's back? That, that's literally what it's talking about. The fact that the, the weight is so much that it's a back-breaking weight. In fact, this is the same Hebrew word that's used in, in Genesis when, when God is looking at the earth and, and he sees that there's so much sin and the weight of all the sin that, that God saw said, all right, I, I've got to do something. It was, it was a back-breaking amount of sin that, that moved God into action. And, and just FYI, this is why I think we should all love Jesus so much because Jesus took the weight of the world's sin upon himself. Can you imagine that burden of sin? Every single sin that has ever been committed, Jesus Christ took that upon himself. Thank you, Jesus. It weighs heavily 
on humanity. God gives some people great wealth and honor and everything they could ever want, but then he doesn't give them the chance to enjoy these things. They die, and someone else, even a stranger, ends up with their wealth. This is meaningless. There's that word again. Over and over and over. It's an emptiness. It's a vaporous. It's a soap bubble. It's empty to have all of these possessions. A heavy load. Have you noticed that the more you have, the more that you, that you can worry about it? The more you have, the more there is to insure. The more there is to wash. The more there is to clean. The more there is that, that breaks down, the more there is that gathers dust, the more there is that needs to go into the uh, shop and, and get fixed. It's a heavy load. How many of you have ever felt the heavy load of, of the stuff? It always costs more to have more. If the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, you can bet that the water bill's higher too. John Ruskin tells a story about a pirate, and he had a, a pretty good load of, of a loot, and he got shipwrecked, and he didn't want to see the, the loot go down, and so he, he took a rope and he tied like 200 pounds of gold to his waist, and he tried to start swimming for shore. <laughs> and as you can imagine, the, the weight of the gold started pulling him under the water. And so Ruskin asked the question, he said, did, did the pirate have the gold, or did the gold have him? And how many of us, we feel that, that pull, and, uh, it, and it's difficult. So what do you do? This week and last week, I, I really appreciate uh, giving us some answers because sometimes he just like puts out this real nasty you know, statement or this whole idea and it kind of is like a, what I call a stinker. It's like, oh, that's just a stinky man. And, and what do you do about that? It just leaves it with this depressing uh, taste in your mouth. But last week, he says it's not good for man to be alone. And then he goes on and says, well, what, what needs to happen is you have to have relationships. And so he talks about relationships, how that's the antidote to being alone. Well, today, the same thing. It's like, man, money's not going to make you happy. It's a weight. It's a burden. What do you do? Well, he, uh, he, 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 he helps us here in uh, chapter 6. He says, learn to enjoy what I have instead of acquiring more. Please ask you 6, 9, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, he confesses the fact that he says, I have learned, and this is something we all have to learn, he says, I have learned the secret of contentment. And so contentment is something that we must learn. And he says, I have had to learn to, to be content whether I have a little, I'm, I've got to learn to be content, or, or whether I have a lot, I've, I've learned to be content. And so from the, these statements comes this great verse that we all know. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so that wonderful verse that we love, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 3, 13, is within the context of contentment. And, and him saying, I, I have to learn this. And this is something that we all have to learn. Learn to enjoy instead of acquiring more. It, it reminds me of how many of you, I, we haven't probably done this in a little while, but uh, how many of you would like to go eat at the buffet? And if you all like the, the buffet, when Caleb goes to the buffet, what does he have, like four, five, six plates sitting out? And uh, he, he'll, he'll finish them all off. And, and so, yeah, we, we love, uh, that's probably his favorite place is the Sirloin Stockade. And we used to go to CeCe's a lot, didn't we? Nikki's mom loved to go to CeCe's. 
and to, uh, what was that uh, Mexican place with a little flag? Uh, ponchos. Oh, she would love to go to Ponchos. So we started going to Ponchos every Tuesday for a little while. Yeah, Nikki's making a throw-up sign because that's exactly <laughs> what too much CCs and too much Ponchos. <laughs> um, but how many of us are guilty of like, you've got your plates and you're sitting there and really you are content, but then you think about that pie that you saw up there. Or you say, I didn't quite have enough room on my plate for whatever it was. Let me go back and get just a little bit more. How many of you have ever been, been guilty of doing that? All right. <laughs> I'm talking to us here today. It's so easy to move beyond the place of I'm good to saying, yeah, let me just get a little bit more. So... We do that with, with our food, and we do that with stuff. And so the, the Word of God teaches us that we, we must learn to enjoy what we have instead of always acquiring more. Philippians 4, I'm sorry, I was saying Philippians 3, Philippians 4.13. Thank you. Philippians 4.13. So Paul is talking in chapter 4, not chapter 3, about contentment. All right, number, the second thing. So here, here's how to, how to unload and here's how to uh, help us with this problem that we all have is to uh, give. And that seems countercultural, doesn't it? Give? Yeah, that's exactly what the Bible teaches us. Give, unload my possessions before my family is stuck with them. Uh, both uh, of uh, Nikki's and I parents, they have these uh, metal storage containers. You know, the, the shipping containers? I think your family's now free of the, of the shipping container. We used to think, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with these crazy shipping containers? We're going to have to dig a big old hole in the ground and then cover them over. But... Uh, So as I said before, it's easy to, to be like critical of someone else, and then you come home to your own house and you realize, wait a minute, who's look? We're no better. I feel sorry for anyone that has to go through our stuff if we were to hit, get hit by the taco truck. <laughs> Ecclesiastes five fifteen. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty handed on the day that we were born. We can't take our riches with us. I was there for the birth of all three of my children, and I will testify that they did come out naked. They did not come out with gold and diamonds and earrings and PlayStations and phones and gadgets and laptops. None of that stuff they came out with. They came out shiny and naked. And the Bible says we're going to leave the earth in the same way. I've gone to four funerals in like the last month and a half or so. And again, the joke is there was no hearst pulling the U-Haul. <laughs> Wasn't happening. I read a story about a guy that says, yeah, I know I can't take it with me, but he got his three closest friends together. He said, guys, I want to I try, though. And so he, he divvied up his, his, his wealth, and you know, he gave each of them like $100,000 each to, to, to put in the, the, the casket, and, and um, that's what their instructions were. But after the funeral, they were getting together, and they were talking. The one guy says, man, I'm so sorry. I, I, just, I knew that I had some needs, and, and there was this orphanage I could help, so I took some of the money, and I didn't put all the, the money in. The guy said, oh, I'm so glad you said that. I did the same thing. You know, I've got this need in our community, and so I gave some money to that. And the third guy was like, I can't believe you guys did that. He says, I gave the whole amount. I dropped in a check. <laughs> so we can't take it with us. But what the, what the Bible teaches us is that we can send it on ahead. And, and I'd like to share with you um, Jesus' words in <clears throat> Luke chapter 12. He, he tells a whole parable about this. In fact, uh, when Jesus was teaching, uh, he got interrupted by somebody. And this is what the interruption was all about. 
Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 22. And uh, no, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, someone called from the crowd and says, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide my father's inheritance with me. So here's Jesus teaching. He gets interrupted by this guy that wants him to help dividing the inheritance. And Jesus said, Friend, who made me a judge? over you to decide such things. He says, and he's told the crowd, he says, beware, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Listen to this. He says, life is not measured by how much you own. Now, isn't that a great Bible verse to memorize? Life is not measured by how much you own. So you ask, how much did so-and-so leave behind? The answer is always all of it. <laughs> All of it, we, we, we leave with nothing. So he, he tells the parable about the rich man who had a fertile farm or produced fine crops, and he said to himself, what do I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And then he says, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger ones, and then I'll have room enough for all my stuff. And, uh, and I'll sit back and say to myself, friend, you have enough stored away for years now. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. So again, nothing wrong with the stuff, nothing wrong with eating and drinking and being merry. Those are all great things. Solomon never says anything against enjoying life or any of these kind of things. So what Jesus reminds us of, he goes on to tell the story this. He says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night, who will get everything that you've worked for? You're going to die. So Jesus says, he says, such as the person is a fool for storing up earthly wealth without having any kind of godly wealth. So earthly wealth on its own for pleasure, satisfaction, all that kind of stuff is a problem if we don't have a relationship with God, being wealthy toward God. So Jesus actually tells us how to do that in, in Luke chapter 12. He says, don't worry about whether you have enough to eat, for life is more than food and your body than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or build barns, but God takes care of them. Are you far more, are you not far more valuable than the birds? Can worry at a single moment to your life. Look at the lilies, how they grow, and they don't Worry about their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautiful as one of these lilies. If God cares so much for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, does he not care for you? And don't be concerned about what you're going to eat or drink, for uh, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows what you need. Seek first the kingdom. And all these other things will be given to you. Give, Jesus says, then you will store up treasures in heaven. And the persons of heaven will never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus reminds us, to give, and then that way our treasure is in heaven. So anything that, that, that's left here can be destroyed by the moth, the rust, the tax man. But what we give is what we send ahead. And so it's, it's treasure in heaven. So as mentioned earlier, we do have uh, the tithe challenge. And uh, if you've never given God this opportunity to test him and to see what happens, then um, you know you can you can sign up for that, and we'll send you a weekly email. Uh, I have a weekly devotion that we send out. But let me just read to you this this challenge. This is from um, Malachi, chapter three, verses nine and ten, and uh, he says this. He says, "Test me, and see if I will not." Open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great that you won't have room enough for it. Uh, try this and put me to the test, verse 10. Put me to the test. And so this is something that we offer usually once a year. Sometimes we may skip a year, but we always offer the tithe challenge. This is an opportunity just to, to let 
uh, you see what God will do when you trust him with your finances. And so when people take the child challenge, what they'll say is that um, a lot of different things happen. Sometimes people uh, get checks in the mail. How many of you have ever gotten a check in the mail? It's like, what? Why did I get a check in the mail? Sometimes you get a check in the mail. Sometimes people... Uh, they, they'll get fired from one job, but then all of a sudden they pick up another job that pays them twice as much. Um, all kinds of different things can happen when we put God to the test. It could be financial, but, you know, there's also a lot of uh, blessing that can come that's just spiritual blessing. There, there's a sense of contentment and joy when we give to the Lord. So you know, God has always blessed um, Nikki and I. And um, lately, we've had kind of a, a string of challenges. Uh, we had a leak in the house, and so now we have some of our wall that's cut out, and we're working with the, the insurance company, which I feel is kind of lowballing us. Uh, also, my truck's transmission went out, and so I'm dealing with that. That's going to be, uh, you know, another expense. And so it's easy to think, well, you know, if I wouldn't have given so much to the church, I'd have a little bit more money to be able to take care of things. And Nikki's shaking her head like, no, 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 no. We, and I say that because we would never, ever, ever say that. We would never, ever, ever feel that because what we have sent on ahead is an investment. And, and even, the, even though we have these issues, we have the means to be able to take care of them. And so we've been blessed, even though we may trip, and we, even though there may be something that needs to be done, uh, we, God has blessed us to be able to be able to take care of these things. And so uh, giving won't take away all of your problems, but it does draw your heart closer to the Lord because God, Jesus says where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. And so when our heart is in Jesus, then our heart feels closer to him, and we want to give more and more and more to God's kingdom, not less. And so this is one of the huge antidotes to our materialistic world. Uh, number one, realize I've got to learn to be content. And, and, and man, we, that's a hard lesson, isn't it? Learn contentment. And number two, have an open hand to God. Because if our, if our hand is like this, we, we may hold on to our stuff, but guess what? God can't put any more in there. And so when we open up our hand, uh, it, it's 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 a, it's a flow, a flow of blessings, peace, joy, contentment, happiness. Uh, that's what God would have us to have is an open hand and an open heart towards him. So what I've discovered when it comes to Jesus is that um, the greatest thing is that we possess is not a thing. The greatest thing that we possess is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I just want to leave you with a, a story that kind of summarizes this, I think, what we learned today. Minecraft founder Marcus Person, also known as Notch, he sold his creation of Microsoft for $2.5 billion. Think about that, a payday of $2.5 billion. Would you like... Hey, I got it made now. I got $2.5 billion. So this was uh, his payday, $2.5 billion for selling Minecraft to Microsoft. And he retired, obviously, and he bought a $70 million home. Uh, and he put in a wall of candy. Something Caleb would do, right? He'd have a wall of Sour Patch and... And he, and he threw constant parties. So here's a young guy with $2.5 billion, a wall of candy, and a $70 million home, throwing parties all the time. Listen to these ecclesiastic <laughs> tweets. The problem with getting everything is that you run out of reasons to keep trying. And human interaction becomes impossible due to imbalance. He says, I'm hanging out in Ibiza, wherever that is, with a bunch of friends and partying with famous people. I'm able to do whatever I want, and I've never felt more isolated. So he's surrounded by famous people and parties, but he feels completely empty. 
He says, when we sold the company, our biggest effort went into trying to make sure that all the employees got taken care of. He said, now they all hate me. Found a great girl, but she's afraid of me and my lifestyle. And I went with a normal person instead. So here's a guy that has it all, but he will, he will tell you, no, I don't have it all because I don't have any relationships. And so when I read a story like this, I think, oh, man, if you just knew Jesus, if you just knew the Lord Jesus Christ, he could fill your heart and, and, and you would have the, the most important relationship, the most important possession. And so um, today as we close, I hope that you have received Jesus into your heart and that you realize that Christ is the greatest gift that's on this planet today. Forgiveness, hope, a future, that's what Jesus Christ offers all of us. And I hope that you've received Christ, I hope that you live for Christ, and that he's what gives your life meaning and purpose. Uh, Peter says it this way best, in Peter chapter 1, he says, we've not been redeemed or purchased. That's another way to think about that. We've not been purchased with perishable things such as gold and silver, but we have been redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's the most precious possession in all of eternity. More than all the gold, more than all the silver is that redemption from Jesus Christ. Are you thankful for him? I am. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how true that it is. And we've all, at one point, have experienced the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that each of us here today, you would help us to learn to be content. Lord, I pray that you would help us to enjoy the blessings and the gifts, especially the relationships that you've placed in our lives, Lord. May we enjoy those fully. Lord, may, we, may you help us understand that it's not about more stuff, but it's more of you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would seek you. I pray that we would give to you, Lord. I pray that we would desire to store up treasure in heaven. So thank you for the, for the, uh, the gifts that we have, that we're stewards, and may we give back to you, knowing that we're making a difference for all of eternity. Thank you so much for the difference that you make. Thank you, Jesus, the most precious possession that we can have. That relationship is priceless. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for those that have received you. And Lord, I pray for those that still need to receive you. We, we lift up those who still need Jesus. Lord, as we reach out to our community this fall and as we send out mailers and as we get out in the community, Lord, I pray that you would draw people to you and may our church body and, and, and the people here be instruments of your love and grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.